And I'm just starting the recording. Cool, okay. Um, really quickly, I wanna share a couple of Audubon updates. Uh, we have a new website where you can stay up to date on our programming and it is www.sevtas.org. And I'll post that in the chat box in a minute as well. And I'd also like to provide an update on the Christmas bird count. The 121st National Audubon Christmas bird count will take place all over the world between December 14th and January 5th. And this year will be the 60th year that the Brattleboro count takes place. Our count is scheduled for Saturday, December 19th. Um, birders of all experience levels will canvas a 15 mile diameter circle around Brattleboro from sunup to sundown, keeping track of all the birds they see. At the end of the day, we will gather to compile the data that will go to National Audubon. It is the longest running citizen science project in the world. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the governor's most recent guidance, we will be instituting a number of changes to this year's count. The compilation potluck will now be held on Zoom. Uh, we'll still get the chance to hear about what everybody saw, but unfortunately we won't get to enjoy everybody's terrific cooking this year. Um, there'll be a, I'll share that link in the chat box later in case you want to register for that Zoom. And then participants who are doing the field count um, are going to only bird with members of their immediate household because of the governor's order that prohibits the gathering of folks from different households. So um, if you did the field count in the past, you'll want to coordinate with the area leader for your count to figure out how they're breaking up the route so that each person gets to bird some. Um, and then you could also always just do a feeder count and we're really encouraging feeder counts this year. We can actually get really good data if we get a lot of feeder counts and get them spread out over the whole count circle. Um, and you can email me if you want a data sheet for the feeder count, or you can also go on our website and they're on there under the Christmas bird count page. Um, cool. Tonight's presenter is Eric Slayton. Eric is an accomplished avian researcher that has captured and banded a variety of birds all over the world. He launched a new bird banding program on Hogback Mountain in Marlboro just this year with spring and fall seasons. Eric is joining us tonight to tell us more about the program and share some highlights. Please welcome Eric. Hello. Um, this is first for me, of course. And Corey, you're gonna make sure that everybody can hear me and see what we're talking about. Well done. Um, I don't know how many people are out there. I'm gonna assume that there's thousands. <laughs> um, or four, which doesn't matter to me. So I'm excited to be able to share what, what we're doing up here in our neighborhood, up on Hogback in Marlboro, which uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone, including this chapter of the Audubon uh, for supporting this project and uh, helping get some new safer mist nets. Um, the priority whenever doing field work like this is to the birds that we're studying and there's uh, a priority to their well-being. So we wanna make sure our equipment is all up to date and, and in best quality so that while we're collecting these birds, we're releasing them unharmed. And so thank you again. And to all the volunteers that have come out, I, between spring and fall together, there's had to, there's probably 60 people have come through to come for a day or some multiple days. And uh, it's just so wonderful. Uh, in a lot of ways, this project to begin with is a pilot year, which was a very successful pilot year, it was also about enrichment for the community to get people away from, well, funny enough, their screens, um, but and get out into the field and um, either add to the experience that they've already had with, with birds and bird banding and, and all that, or something brand new and uh, maybe open up something that they never expected that to be part of in uh, a new world of birds to them. So very exciting. Mm -hmm. So today, and also Corey, uh, if people have questions, just jump right on in. As we're going through the presentation, please, whatever question it is, uh, if I don't see the question, if you wanna just chime in and tell me what it is. Yep, I can track the chat box for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, this is a, you guys, they're, they're, I never, I don't consider myself a an, an a top-notch birder. I can hold my own, that's for sure, and I I've been doing it for a long time. I love it, but that's not what this talk is about. It's not about birding prowess. It's about having an opportunity to look at some of the finer details of a bird while you have it in the hand. Of course, when it's in a tree or flying past you, you might get a little 
tidbit of this, or that, or the other thing, color, shade, text, you know, texture, pattern, right, behavior. But when you have it in the hand, you can actually get a little closer look. And um, what I'm doing while it's in the hand is looking at the age of the bird, if I can age the bird, and the sex of the bird, of course, if they're, um, even if they're, um, uh, well, if they're dimorphic, then that's obvious, pretty obvious. You can tell the sex, but sometimes you can do measurements and the measurements will identify the, the, the sex of the bird, male or female. There's a lot of overlap with songbirds. So most of that population, if you're doing measurements, is going down as unidentified um, during every time of the year except the summer. And we'll get to that in a second. But, um, but there are some examples with wing measurements and tail measurements and so forth where it says, oh, this is a boy or this is a girl. So anyway, we're going to look at some of those finer details of what it's like to have a bird in the hand and the opportunities to see uh, things that are much more difficult to see in the field, with, even with great optics. And if you're with a birder who says, oh, that's a hat shear for sure, you know, they I'd say, what are you looking for? They might say, well, we're looking at absence of a wing bar or looking at, I can see, I can see a molt limit or something like that. Well, that's cool. But now I guarantee you, you'll be able to see that with these, some of these pictures. Um, and of course, some of these pictures were done by other people. And so I thank those photographers out there that have come that took some wonderful shots of our, our little project. So there we are um, at the first slide. Uh, sitting around a little station there with different people helping out. Um, uh, Corey's been there a few times, so he knows what it's like. It's a beautiful little spot just at the base of the Hogback Mountain Ski Area. And um, please, if you haven't been out, I'll be out in the spring. And so hopefully you'll come out and check it out at some point. Um, and there's a, 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 one of our hermit thrushes in and looking at... Uh, at the the wing, the age of the feathers that we're going to look at primaries, coverts, and primary feathers, and then secondary coverts. And like right here, if you can see my cursor moving, even in this first slide, the remnants of these buffy tips indicating that this is a hatchier bird. That the, the adults usually lose these buffy tips by the time that they molt out their plumage into adult to adulthood. So it's helping me age that, that bird right there. All right, so moving on to the first slide. Let's hope this works. Oh, there we go. Corey, thumbs up and moved on to the next slide. All right, great. Just some pretty pictures. We get all kinds of birds and, uh, and boy, having a woodpecker in the hand is actually pretty special. Uh, anybody who's at the banding station and there's a woodpecker in the net um, and they're like, ooh. And understandably so, they are really charismatic and beautiful birds. Um, red-bellied woodpecker and a sapsucker. All right, um, getting into looking at the wings and so forth is on the left side of the screen is a northern flicker, of course. And on this wing here, oh, what's interesting about flick, uh, woodpeckers in general is most birds you identify them as a hatch year or hatching year being the first year or a second year if it's a young bird. but and then after hatch year, meaning that it's, old, it's older than its first year of life. And you can't tell once it's beyond its first year of life based on plumage, how old it is. Woodpeckers, they have an after third year. There's an after second year and after third year because they show molt limits. In the woodpecker, in the flicker on the left there, I'm seeing no molt limit there whatsoever. down as after third year because I'm seeing no molt limit whatsoever. Now, molt limit that I'm looking for is present on the other screen here, which is one of our juncos. And if you're looking right where I'm moving the cursor around, look at these, these brown feathers, They're actually even a different length. Often hatchier birds have longer flight feathers than adult birds do. So there's even the presence of an all retained hatchier feathers or in a, in a molt limit compared to these all adult molted out feathers here. So I'm guessing this actually was in the spring and this is a, what could be called a second year bird. So it was born in the year 2000, uh, what year are we in? Two, how can you forget, 2020? So this would have been spring 2020. It was, it was hatched in the year 2019. So it was in its second calendar year. It's a second year bird. 
So far, so good. Did we lose everybody? <laughs> no, of course not. We're here. Okay. Good, good. Okay. All right. There. Uh, let's go. Right. I'm having technical difficulties. There we go. Perfect. All right. Um, and then, of course, looking at some of the more details, if you look at this bird here, which is actually a, a bay-breasted warbler in the fall, you also look at the, the look at these white tips. Often, this is something you you need to look at in the hand to help identify. Oops, look at that. Uh, help identify that species. The white tips on the tips of the primaries and secondaries. Very fine detailing, and the and the leading edge of the wing too. This is a second year bird, or I mean a, a, a hatch year bird, because I'm pointing to a, a olive edge here on the wing, but there is some feathers that are not showing that olive edging. So this has, uh, actually has a molt limit. And so this is uh, in its first fall migration uh, as, a, as a bird. And these are fine things you're looking at in the hand and you're combining all this information with, you don't just usually identify an age of a bird with just one one field mark, you're usually combining, it's like a formula you combine together. Over here, you might recognize just this bird here with the throat and everything, kind of like, almost like it's in a tree you know, with branches and everything, you only get is a little bit of a chin, some wing bars, right? Maybe you get a little bit on the rump or whatever, or some back feathers. This is a magnolia warbler. And this is a bird that is all fully molted out. These are all adult feathers. These primary coverts are what you usually look at, the shape and the wear and usually the leading edge. These are nice and black and dark versus maybe gray or brown for a hatch here. And also the centers of the back, the black marks in the center of back is also a nice indicator of, of age for, for this species. Here we have our yellow rump warbler or myrtle warbler. Um, very, by the way, if you want to be challenged in the fall with aging, this species is, I, for me, definitely the most challenging. There's so much variation in between the male and females, between hatch year and after hatch year. Very tough species to, to get a sense on. And some banding locations where you, you might have uh, 200 in a day, some of the coastal sites, you might have a lot of myrtles, you're processing a lot of birds, you gotta know it pretty well in order to get them through uh, safely. So, a nice challenge. But here's a nice yellow rump warbler. Any questions, Corey? No. No, and if folks have questions out there, feel, feel free to type them in the chat box or you can just unmute and ask. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here we are with uh, same species, two different moles basic and alternate molt, all right? We have clearly a, a male, adult male magnolia warbler in full spring breeding plumage. And then here, this is actually an adult male um, magnolia as well. They both are, uh, but they're in, they're in their fall plumage. So, right, there you go. That's kind of fascinating. Um, the reason why I know that this is a male, not a female, is because these bold black streaks on on the flank and on the on the breast of the. Oh, another fact, another feature to look at for magnolia warblers is the amount of white in the tail feathers. It ranges from small little patches of the hatchier female to larger white, and we're looking at the the, the patch of white here on the closer to the deck feather. The deck feather is the, the centered feathers on a, of, a, of a bird, and then they radiate out R2 retresses is the term used. So this is R2, and we're trying to look at, determine how much white is in the R2 feathers. This is coming clearly as an adult male in the fall, okay, in its alternate, uh, in, in its basic plumage. Um, so what a shift between the uh, basic plumage and the alternate plumage for the same species. All right. Um, if I had more pictures to like show a female and everything, I just didn't have, I don't have a full complement of pictures of, of all the different ages, but this is a start to give you a sense of there are differences between the ages and the sexes and also the season. Uh, here we go, looking at a wing. 
of look at look at the magnolia warbler look at the small spots on this also this is this is a hatchier bird by the way much much smaller look at the size of the white on this patches here versus over here right much much smaller i also the shape and wear of the tail feather is another factor to look at in aging a bird these all are showing that they're not, they're freighted they're not fresh they look like they've been used you know the bird is doing what it needs to do to survive and it's out there and it's the feathers are worn out they also have a, a shape to them that are more spear pointed shape they have more of a deep v shape which is subtle but in the hand you can definitely see it so right away i'm just using three factors the, the wear of the feather the, the amount of white in the r2 and the shape it gives me the age of the bird whereas over here let's see if i can move that out of the way Oops. Okay, look at the shape, the, compare the shape of the, the feathers on this. They're much fresher. They have a more truncated shape and there's a whole bunch more white. So bingo, bango, you got a after hatch here over here. Cool. All right, some pretty pictures. I don't have much to say about these two except for them being males. <laughs> um, and clearly, oh, oh boy, I wish I did have pictures of, of the Red Start because they are showing the, the, the age and sex of this species is really great. Um, they really change, the, the hatch here male really changes quite a bit. Hold on for a second, guys. Hey, honey, can you turn that down, please? Can you turn that down, please? Sharing a house. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um, so, right, the, the, the hatch here, Red Start, got to look it up in your field guides. You'll see it looks nothing like the adult Red Start, um, a male, I should say. But actually, the, the adult male looks a lot like the, the, uh, the hatch here male looks a lot like the adult female, funny enough. Um, just inside a warbler. This feels like it's a it's a early spring shot, but I can't remember when this is. But um, uh, or maybe is it a fall? I can't I can't really tell now. Anybody want to guess? If this is spring or fall based on the background. <laughs> and the chestnut. Well, they don't they they have a basic and alternate molt too. So I would say that this if this is an adult male, that this would be um, a fall shot. That this is. This is molted out of its breeding plumage during for migration. All right. Aha. One of my favorites. I'm sure a lot of other people feel the same way. Where am I putting these pictures here? Okay. So we have our black and white warblers. Here's the male and here's the female. Look at the facial markings that uh, are are what you use in the hand very easily, the buff throat, the buff around the eye versus the nice black and white and the white throat. Uh, looking here to the wing, here's a great example of a molt limit here. These are molted out. This is a hatchier bird. These are the nice black feathers that the adult, oh shoot, sorry. There we go. Um, if you look at the primary coverts, look at those are, are one is here for the adults. All right, pretty clear. Something you can't see in the field, you know, with binoculars for this species at least, but it's kind of cool in the hand how, how it's, there it is. It's pretty noticeable and it's kind of neat to see now uh, there's feathers that were the bird was hatched with and there's just started to molt out and to replace them. These haven't been replaced yet. And then look at the white edging, even on the adult too. So very different between the two. Okay, let's move on to the next. Here we got a nice, get a little bit of that. Everybody loves the confusing fall warblers. Here we go. Here's one of them. And that's what it looks like in the spring, the black cap. Look at the green, the olive green edging on the primaries for both 
they, those ex exist in the alternate and basic plumage, but look at the color changes here for the fall um, black pole warbler. And on the slide on the right, you're just looking at a black and white versus a black pole. Don't, don't think that that's not, that's, uh, that's just the difference there. And look how the black, black and white does not have the olive edging on the primary feathers. Really cool stuff. All right. More confusing warblers. Very, very confusing. If you get to see any of these during migration and you're like, what is that? What is that? Well, honestly, I'd say the same thing. <laughs> but when you have them in the hand, uh, or if you get to see, look at that little detail right there, which is diagnostic right there, the yellow feet. So there you go for all those that are guessing at home. Um, yep, we have the yellow feet of the black pole and this right here, which looks a lot like it, but isn't, is a bay breasted warbler. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't try to guess in the field, even down to the uh, white on the outer retresses, move that out of the way. They both have uh, R6 and R5 have a bit of white on the outer retresses, which doesn't show in this picture here, but they do there. It shows there. So really, really tough. Um, here's, here's three pictures of bay breasted warbler um, showing some of the different details. The R, the, the, out of the little white patches on the R6 and R5 here um, and shape of the feather and everything. These are truncated feathers. So this is an after hatch here um, bird. Um, here on the wing is showing green edging on the primary coverts, also black. So there's no molt limit here. Another example of an after hatch here. I'm going to move this out of the way. And look at that little remnant of that bay breast field mark, the little buffy flank sticking out, sticking under the wing there, um, or a little remnant of what's left for the bay breast warbler. I was so excited to not only have a chance to have bay breasted in the hand as part of this project, but also the black poles. Pretty, pretty neat, especially if you know about the, the migratory path of the black pole, how it jumps out across the Atlantic, you know, for it to be coming through here and a chance to see it before it heads across the Atlantic, pretty special. Um, and bay breasted as well. I, you know, that's, that's a bird you only see during migration as far as I'm on. Is that true? Yeah. Eric, do you remember when uh, the black pole, <coughs> the black pole came through? Oh, I, we had a number of black pole and bay breasted. It wasn't just a single individual. Um, if I try to look it up at this second, I might lose you all. But it was in October. It was in early October. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but it had a, a number. I, I think I'm guessing had at least six black poles, and I think even more bay breasted. So really neat. Well, uh, one one net uh, clearly they they were flying in a in a in a group because one net had like five black poles in it together just in one spot. So they were obviously traveling in a group. Um, I I can definitely send you those numbers. I can I, I'll send Corey my whole um, submitted data and you can all look at it and you can enjoy the numbers. You can look at the weights and the wing cords and so forth and the dates and everything and play with it as you wish. I'll send it to Corey and you can look through it. And the, the spring, the spring uh, I had, uh, was it 10 nets we had up, Corey? Do you remember 10, nine or 10? Had about a hundred birds total effort wise is okay, not great. Um, and this in the fall had about 230 total birds and what happened happens in the fall is, and I expected this, is you get these little fallout um, situations, especially with white-throated sparrows and even with the uh, kinglets. And so some nets had so many birds in them that I was just taking them out and tossing them, I not processing them or anything. So as far as birds in the net, we had probably had um, another 50 more and I just, for the safety of the birds, didn't have the, the facility to handle all of them. So get them out of the net and off they go. 
Um, but the, the fall was a decent, decent effort. I was excited. Uh, we had 11 nets in the fall. Um, okay, so oh, this was one of the highlights, right? Uh, should I let you ponder over what it is first? Some of you, of course, know what it is right away. And, um, and I, when I saw it in the net, I was like, hmm, what is this? Because I've never banded one of these before. Um, someone want to type it in? And there's Smith there. It's a Vireo. We can all agree on that. And look at the tip of the upper mandible, that little extra hook for fly catching. Really great little adaptation. Um, it looks a lot like our blue headed Vireo, but it's from the lovely city of in Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Vireo. So cool. I thought it was cool. Yep. Even if you do this forever and ever and ever, and you've handled thousands of birds, it's like, oh, look at that. And I thought that was really neat. So very excited about that one. And here's our more common and wonderful, very charismatic, love having these birds around our solitary or blue-headed vireo. What is it called now? What do people call it? Blue-headed. Blue-headed, yeah. I mean, what, what a beauty, huh? So anyway, that's blue-headed vireo. All right, well, thrushes are a big part of Vermont and how wonderful we are, well, how lucky we are to have thrushes up here, um, singing and keeping us company and so forth, including Bick Nell's thrush. Look at that. A Bick Nell's thrush was banded this past spring. Very, very exciting. Very closely resembling the great cheek thrush and a little less, but closely resembling the Swainson's thrush. So, that was very exciting. This happens to be a hatch, uh, after hatch year um, as well. Um, and um, for a big nail, since they, they do not sing when you have them in your hand, <laughs> they are not gonna offer their song to you. Uh, you have to do measurements, uh, wing and tail measurements to key it out from the closely related and resembling great cheek thrush. They are smaller in measurement than the great cheek thrush, basically. And let's see what happens here. Oh, I didn't get to that picture yet, but um, here's Swainson's Viri, very nice, and hermit thrush. So we get, you know, I uh, so far the there's another thrush that's missing. Well, there's two, but actually I only caught like one robin but I only caught one wood thrush the whole, whole spring and fall season, just one wood thrush. Um, there we go, okay. So here is a Bicknell's thrush, and this is actually a hermit thrush um, showing the uh, buffy tips here. That's part of the hermit thrush. And this right here, this is also an indication of hermit thrush, these little covert um, buffy tips as well. So, but we are looking here at the shape of the wing and the relationship of the primary uh, flight feathers, the, the length and relationship to each other uh, with, for example, this hermit thrush, not the greatest picture, but trust, trust, trust me, this right here, by the way, that is a bird's the P10 feather is reduced. So this is P9876. And that's emarginated, by the way. You see right there, that will cut in the feather. So you're looking at P6's feather being either emarginated or not emarginated. And here it's emarginated. Let's see, 9876. Let's see. I'm looking at the, 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 key, the key factor here is the distance between P9 and I think it's P6. And it comes in to be like four millimeters or less, and it's a big nose thrush. So in other words, the, the relationship between the feathers, it's a, it's a rounder wing. It's not as a pointier wing. The, the, the greater the distance between the tips of, of the, the primaries, 
the pointier the wing would be. For a big nose, it's more, it's rounder, it's stubbier in a sense. So there's also tail measurement that you do as well. So pretty exciting, big nose thrush. Um, I'm hoping that maybe I can uh, get some support to get some nano tags to put on big nails in the spring uh, I, and, and so that they can be tracked up to their breeding grounds and then all the way back to their winter grounds. Vermont Center for Ecosystem Studies, of course, who spearheaded all that wonderful work with the Bicknells. I should reach out to them and see if they actually have some nano tags I can place on some Bicknells and be part of their project. I'm sure that if they do, they'll be glad to, to offer a couple. Interesting here. So we had some, some gray-cheeked and Bicknells in the spring heading north to their final nesting breeding ground. But in the fall, didn't have any of them. And my thinking is that their first flight, their first migration, their first evening heading south is not that far north. And they could easily pass over the hog back latitude in one night's flight. So I wouldn't expect to see any in the fall. They would just head right over the state of Vermont and land somewhere in southern Massachusetts or Connecticut or New York, anywhere, you know, anywhere down there, especially the Bicknells with their, their range not being that much further north. Um, but going north from this in the, in the spring, they're just hop skipping and jumping and they're going to land wherever they land. And even if they're only 20 miles till they get to um, Stratton, for example, or not even, they don't necessarily, that's just the the day end, the night ended and their migration stopped for the night and they came down. So if that made sense to you, <laughs> I hope it did. Um, that was something I, I feel like I observed and, and put together in my head. So I wouldn't expect to see them in the fall, but in the spring, hopefully we'll see some, if they survive all these hurricanes and all this. Can you explain that, what, what you said, of, what was that, putting a nano band or what? Oh, a, a nano tag is a, is a small transmitter uh, of a signal that's then picked up by towers and is like a tracking device. Yeah, got and they're it. called okay. nano yeah. tags because they're small. Um, they're, they, they go on the back of the bird. They're like a little bat oh, They have a little battery and an antenna. Um, oops briefly and you guys can go check out their website and learn about it. low somewhat of a low tech or it's a ground based tracking system versus satellite tracking all right so big nails thrush don't stop the video okay um one of my favorites too uh clear sexual dimorphism here uh we have our black throated blue warbler and um, they don't have a uh, alternate basic plumage. This is just the way they look. Um, one of the classic field marks is this wing patch here. Some people call it, I think, a handkerchief. Is that right? I think, yeah, something like that. But um, the, the males and the females both have them. The males is much larger than the female. And if this, this right here, is a after hatch year and a uh, female you can maybe pick in this pick up a picture a little bit of blue iridescence quite a beautiful bird in the hand um you might say oh up in the tree it's kind of drab and gray and olive and all that but in the hand especially the adult females have this beautiful iridescence in like the wrist here and on the crown things like that and in the tail feather that's really striking and that white patch there next time you're out in the field and you see a black throated blue female and it has a white you can see the white patch on the wing you can tell your friends that's a after hatcher because the hatchier female would not show that patch at all so you just impress your friends right away saying oh that's an after hatcher guarantee it so <laughs> um the males it's a little bit more uh of a the males, the hatchier males are also blue. They have an iridescent green mixed in. I'll show you in a slide soon. 
they both have the patches, the, the adult male patch is greater, which is a little bit more difficult to decipher in the field. So I wouldn't try that trick with the males. All right. So here is, uh, oh boy, it's not great, but I think you can see it if your screen is decent. This is a, a, a hatchier male. Uh, it's not really showing. There, are, there were some green, there's green highlights in some of the feathers on the edging. These are blue. So if you're saying, well, would those look blue, wait, what's wrong with you? No, those are blue. But there are green highlighted um, edged feathers as well. And, the, and especially on the back, some of the back feathers have green highlights. That makes it a hat shear. Well, let's see. I think this, yeah, look at that. I just love that picture. Here's a little call note. Is that awesome? <laughs> That's just pretty cool. I thought you, I hope you thought that was cool too. <laughs> um, okay. Moving on. A lovely little bird. Full white eye ring, gray head, yellow throat. Nashville warbler. <coughs> Very cool, very small bird. This bird weighs in at about seven grams, which is like a, a nickel plus a, not even a dime. If you put a nickel and a dime in your hand, that weighs more than this bird does total. Um, but a Nashville warbler, it was lovely to have them pass through. And then we had this bird come through. I was like, wait, that's not a Nashville. It doesn't, but it could, and so it's much bigger. And here is our Connecticut warbler, and that was pretty special as well. I think I think I've only banded one or two uh, before, and that was much further south than here during the fall migration. White eye ring, gray head, but gray throat, very deep olive back. Um, and a very impressive large, large warbler. Pretty cool. Um, very lucky. No idea. It was a slow day, I think, as well in the spring and I mean the fall. And uh, um, as all of a sudden, wait a second, this Connecticut warbler shows up. So, you know, even if you're out there birding and it's a slow day, you never know. You never know. You never know. It's pretty cool. Moving on to, uh, here's a little bit of a dimorphism between the, the two, male and female. Here's your male, this is classic full adult male with the black masking and little white highlights above that mask. And here's a female. This actually is a, an a, a after hatch year female. I know that because of the brightness of the throat. The hatchier females have a very dull, almost drab throat compared to, and, and which blends into its flank and so forth. Whereas the adult female has a more of a matching throat like the, like the male does. All right. Uh, looking at, and wear feathers again for a couple common yellow throats. On the left, look at those worn out feathers of the hatch ear. And look at the truncated shape per year offset point and the freshness of the after hatch ear feathers for common yellow throat. We had, this was our only Interesting, well, we had some Phoebes, born lovely, but this is our only uh, non-Phoebe flycatcher. And they are a challenge even in the hand. And again, this was not offering its song or telling us what habitat it lives in. Um, so we had to do some, some body measurements, including shape of bill, even the color of the underside of the bill. 
uh, and of course, relationship of length of feathers to, uh, with each other. Uh, this came in as an alder blind catcher. And, uh, after hatch year, look at those nice dark primary coverts. Okay. Also, the the color of the uh, wing bars. Uh, these are still look. They look buffy, but um, the adults ha are whiter and sharper than the hatch years. The hatch year wing bars are buffier, much buffier than this. All right. So an older flycatcher. Um, but. Full disclosure, I wasn't absolutely 100% convinced. So what I, I recorded it, it as is a trails flycatch, which is a, a classification for a, a group of flies catchers that you <laughs> can't, that are like the, the willow and, and alder. You don't, can't even identify in the hand. And so you just side of caution, I put it down as trails. Here's that same trails flycat, and here's a Phoebe wing, just to give you a sense of a wing of, an, of another flycatcher. Um, and let me get the picture out of the way here. Yeah. This is looking like an awfully, uh, a lot, very worn feathers and everything. Uh, Honestly, I, and that's a very old feather. This is a hatchet bird. Maybe you're picking up on those details already. Just look at the, the age difference. Here's a molt limit right here. So versus this bird here, where there's, those are all fresh and clean, fresh tips on the secondaries, leading edges of the secondaries. Good looking bird. Oh. Finally, we got into October, and I mean, look at that bird. I mean, that's a rock star. I mean, that really is an awesome bird. So and look at that. That's great. So we have ruby crowned and golden crowned both showed up in numbers, and so wonderful to have them. These birds here are weighing five grams, which is literally what a nickel five cent piece weighs. So, you know. Just next time you have a nickel in your hand, that's all these birds weigh. Pretty, pretty amazing. Um, Ruby, uh, golden crowned, there it is, a classic orange in the male. And the female has some, I think the female can have a little remnant of orange, but very little. I, I honestly, just having a brain freeze, maybe, maybe that's just another male with some orange, but the males definitely have the orange and the females have the yellow without the orange. Um, and the ruby crown kinglet, this is kind of a cool shot, right? Um, the, the males again have the, the roof, their red spot under the, on the crown, the females do not. And how about this? What is that? That is a bird that just see, you see creeping around the trees, you know, don't ever see it this close. Um, look at those modified tail feathers. Uh, everything about this bird is, a, is is somewhat of a mystery to to researchers still because not not a, they're not well known even still with just more more information is needed. I uh, the 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 field guide I the field guide the 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 guide I use here is finally being by this finally it's from the 90s the last Peter Pyle this is the guide that has all this information in here to help you kind of figure out all these fine tuned deep, these details of aging, sexing, feather shape and all that. And when you get to a creeper, it's like more information needed. <laughs> Basically, well, the, the, the next year, I believe is Pyle's coming out with a new edition, an updated edition, and I'm excited to see the notations that are included under the creepers. So, I mean, look at that model, look at that, and that adaptation, that curve bill, really, and long, long toes and, and, and toenails, really long, even more so than the woodpeckers. Fascinating species, really fascinating species. Um, really exciting for, to see. Them. I think caught about four or five of them, so really great to, to have in the hand. 
Um, and then we got a couple, of mostly white-throated sparrows. We did get a couple of swampies, uh, which is kind of cool because it's not um, But obviously they, they don't mind getting lost up in the mountains. Um, and quite a beautiful bird. This one has a little bit of a strange haircut, not really. Um, something I do, you do in the fall to help age the bird is to push the feathers aside, wet them down, and then look at the skull. And you can see the development of the skull and that can help you age the bird. The hatcher bird doesn't have a fully developed second layer of skull. And you can see very subtly the a distinction between the two layers so you can help you identify it so i wet my finger and i push the feathers aside so i can see uh through the uh, the skin that's what's going on there anyway swamp sparrow um yeah well we know what that is and this is a great example of molt limits Look at this right here. That is a molt limit for sure. And look at this. This is a full complement. And look at those molt limits there. Just a full molt limit for this fully adult bird here. Um, I saw some uh, uh, gross beaks the other day. Pine gross beaks. I saw some pine gross beaks the other day up on Putney Mountain, up on the ridge there. So two, yeah. So, yep. And some people have been seeing siskins, I'm sure. All right. Yeah. Oh, look at that. We moved from little songbirds to raptors. I have a couple of raptor shots. Um, this is a um, hatchier, uh, well, it is actually a hatchier female American kestrel. And the, the decisive field mark is very subtle, but it is the subterminal band uh the black line the black line the hatchier black band is not as developed as it is in the adult the adult black band is twice as large as it is in hatchier and otherwise that is really the only field mark for identifying the age of a of a female kestrel um, and here is not a female kestrel <laughs> it's a female though it's a female northern goshawk and what a, this is a second year bird. This bird is, look at that molt limit there. These are all, look, I mean, all the tail, there's a, there's a fresh tail feather coming in. These are some, this is a retained hatchier tail feather right there. These are all hatchier feathers here. And this is a, these are all, of course, the gray molt limit there, even on that wing. And the eye, is, is was orange versus blood red. So pretty great. And this was just uh, last week up there on, on the ridge on Putney Mountain. So um, there are some goshawks around, which is great. Look at those talons, boy, oh boy. She was making a lot of noise, by the way. Um, and here we have what's cool about red tails. These red tails, like woodpeckers, have a, uh, a three-year molt. So you have a hatch year, you have a second year, and you have an after second year. So you have three-year molting. Um, and this one is showing two ages of adult, of adult tail feathers. And let's see, uh, I know that there's some more. Well, here's right here. If you see the, the dark tipped here and the lighter tipped. Okay, these are different age adult feathers. So we have different, we have, uh, and I can even see even this, the, the tattered old contour feathers versus the feathers right here. It's a subtle, hard to see in a little picture. I don't know how big a screen is, but in the hand, it's like, wow, that's very noticeable. And I just thought it'd be neat to show a picture of, you know, the, the, the step cousin Budio that doesn't get a lot of, you know, you've got broad wings, you know, by the thousands, you've got red tails, and then sneaking in between are these red shoulder talks. And here's, here's that nice, you know, wing patch, the, you know, field mark, the, the crescent that you look for. And, and, the, and this is being, you think of the, the red shoulder having a black and white banded tail. This is a hatchier showing what a hatchier 
tail looks like. Looks nothing like the adult. All right, and here we go. That's just our last shot of finished processing bird, and there it goes. Yay. So um, that's a thank you. project and to everyone that's come out to to help um, and please get involved next spring uh, you can come out for a day and check it out um, no experience is needed uh, you're not extracting birds unless you're maybe like Corey who has had experience and I can trust the person otherwise you're, you're just helping out with releasing birds or you know, recording data or holding birds or cleaning leaves out of the nets or any other logistics so that the birds have the best care as possible so we can get them processed and out uh, unharmed and off back doing whatever that was that they were doing so and having a good time by the way um so eric okay. if people want to if people want to join you next year how do they contact you um uh, how should they contact me actually? What do you think? Do you want them to email yeah. me and I can let you know? Yes, yes. Okay. That'd be great. Um, yeah. I'll put my email address uh, yeah, in here one more time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we meet, um, so the spring will start somewhere early May, depending on the snow. And, uh, and we'll get out there just around sunrise and uh, open the nets. The nets are closed each night and we're not in operation or they closed as soon as you're done with them. And then you unfurl the nets and you check the nets every half hour. And, um, you know, through the month of May, uh, maybe first week in June, and we'll see how it's going. Um, and uh, on fair weather days when it's not too cold and there's definitely no snow or rain and it's not too windy. Um, and we'll see what happens. So it's a wonderful time. I, I obviously enjoy it and I enjoy sharing with people. So I totally encourage you to come reach out to me and we'll schedule a time where, where it's not too many people, like usually three or four people at most get a good experience instead of being a big horde of folks. All right. Cool. Um, there was a question in the chat box. How many birds did you band this round? Uh, banded around 230 uh, and released another I um, that I didn't feel it was safe and even chickadees too that wanted to get them all out of the net as quick as possible and only held the birds I, I think I could, could process safely at one specific net round so so 30 birds uh, for 18 uh, for 18 days I operated the station this fall. Cool. Another question um, was did you band many birds that had been previously banded? Great question. Um, last spring banded a chickadee that was banded by a UMass group that had nets open in 2015. So that bird was banded five years earlier. So that was kind of cool. And then, um, and then in the fall, did did catch a couple of birds that were banded in the spring, that obviously were living there the whole summer and nesting around there. Um, and then also, uh, what's a kind of a nice soft way of indicating length of stopover? It's called is by catching the same bird a day later or two days later or three days or multiple times and you get a, a, a timeline of first capture, second capture, third capture. It gives you a sense of, well, this bird is migrating, but it's been here for four days. So it's staying over. So that's another way we, we've uh, had some recapture depth, but nothing from other sites uh, as of yet. Okay. And then Diana Todd posted that there's information about your project on the Hogback website and that if folks just Google Hogback Vermont, that you'll be able to find that site. Excellent. Yes. 
Yes, and thank you to the hog folks, folks that are wonderful. Um, very excited to to continue this and have project grow and develop more relationships with uh, regional partners. Um, and and even an opportunity for for um, young researchers or grad students looking for for field stations where they can act, um, develop their own research, their own thesis, uh, and have a facility that they could share and utilize. Sometimes you know if you're a grad student and you want to do a, your your thesis, but you have to develop a whole banding station for for two years, uh, it could be a real game. Few in your tracks, being able to fund it and create the whole thing. But if you have a station already established, a student can come in and collaborate. That would be really fantastic. So, um, yeah. Other questions for Eric? Good. I hope that was informative and and entertaining. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this with us tonight. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. You're very, very welcome. My pleasure. And I hope to see all you guys maybe in the spring or I'm around. Uh, I'd love to be part of the Christmas count, even if it's virtual. So, yeah. um, one more question. Somebody asked how you got into banding. Um, well, I guess being into birds and then being a doing being a, I guess I don't know, that's a good I mean banding is just a field technique for studying being a, a, a field biologist banding is just a, a, a class technique for for co collaborate not collaborate for collecting your data set so that you can process your data by putting a band on a bird with a unique can add to that data set, but basically you might never catch that bird again, but you have in your spreadsheet that specific bird going forward with all the other information you collected from body weight and mass and size and, and you take feather samples and whatever you did for the bird, that serial number would go along with all that. The, the netting of the bird, having the bird in your hands, so you can collect all this information and putting a band on the bird is just a mechanism for organizing your, your information. So I've been interested in birds since my you know, late teens and question, and you start asking questions and this is Audubon, did Audubon band bird? No, who was the Peterson banded birds? Who was the one that, Started banning birds long ago with just little twist ties and so forth. Just I think that was John James Audubon, wasn't it? Oh, Aud yeah, yeah, Aud yeah. I think it was Audubon. Because that was how they figured out that birds left and came back to the same spots. Because yeah, right, 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 exactly. Always so, true. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, like in the winter here, um, feeder studies uh, is a kind of a, a fun idea to 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 try to catch and ban color ban some of your feeder birds and then see if they're flying to other neighbors. If you see a chick, I haven't done this, I did this years ago when I was living here, you know, like for chickadees, you put a different color band on its leg. And it, if you see a chickadee with a blue band on its leg, you're like, wait a second, where did that come from? And you can track the movement of this chickadee and, and what, where it's, where it's traveling, what feeders it's visiting, how far is its range, you know, uh, where, where is it traveling to? It's not just sticking around one feeder, it's, it's finding other feeders and then you can kind of a citizen science project too by every time we look at your feeder you see that he is there with a blue band or a red band or whatever something i thought about maybe doing this winter um i have the means to do it the ability and you might be curious to see what that would, would look like and and some some folks want to maybe participate in that we can see what we can do about doing that um, the bands do not hurt the birds, by the way. Plenty of research has been done to see if it, if it hinders the birds in any way, if it, if, it, if it makes it more difficult for them to migrate or to survive, or, or does it attract predators? Does it give it less of an advantage? You know, that kind of thing. And it's shown not to be any of those, those things. So 
Um, that's important to know. Does that answer that question? Kind yeah. Of? Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Eric. Thanks for joining us tonight. Oh yeah, and uh, oh, I, oh, the other, another cool sighting. I, I don't get a chance to talk to bird people too often. <laughs> is I had a a male a northern harrier fly over the house the other day. Nice. We call them gray ghosts because they're all silver, really, yeah. and they flutter through. So that was look up. I was like, what is that? Oh, sure enough, a gray ghost. Look at that. So it's a whole bunch of good stuff still out there. Cool. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Corey. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you, Eric. Thank I'm going to clamshell it. Bye. Hope to see you next spring. Yes.